It's been just over a year since the last U.S. troops left Iraq to discuss the current status of Iraq and look back on the more than eight years of conflict there. We're joined by New York Times national security correspondent Michael Gordon, the author of The Endgame, the inside story of the struggle for Iraq from George W. Bush to Barack Obama. And Mr. Gordon, start with the, uh, the title of your book. What was the end game when we left Iraq in December of last year? Yeah, well, part of what I uh, wanted to do with uh, General Trainer, my co-author, was capture what had happened uh, since the surge. There have been a number of books on the surge of, of forces in Iraq in 2008 and what happened after that. But I was interested in, I think the real question is, what kind of Iraq did the United States leave behind after all this sacrifice, the 45 hundred American lives lost, the tens of thousands wounded, the hundreds of billions of dollars expended. What was American policy toward Iraq and what, what does Iraq look like today? So that was the question I sought to address. And But I ended up pretty much covering the entire scope of the war since I had done a lot of reporting on it. So a, a year on, or I guess in December 2011, what had we achieved? And a year on, have we still achieved that? Well, um, by, by the time of, by December 2000, 2011, there had been a number of elections in Iraq, which was to the good. But Iraq had not fully become a democracy in the sense that there had not been a peaceful transfer of power from the current regime uh, led by Nouri al-Maliki to another, to another prime minister. I think that's the true test of a democracy, is whether there's not merely an election. I mean, Russia has elections. I serve there. But whether there's an election, another candidate wins, and power is handed over to that candidate. Iraq has not past that milestone yet. So what we had in, in December 2011 was a relatively stable Iraq, uh, a lot of hopes. But I think, unfortunately, the situation in Iraq has deteriorated politically over the past year. And also, Iraq has been less aligned with American interests and more aligned with, actually, Iranian interests in, in so far as the Syrian conflict is concerned. And we're taking your calls and questions in this segment, so uh, feel free. The phone lines are open now. Republicans, 202-585-3881. Democrats, 202-585-3880. Independents, 202-585-3882. Uh, give us a ring and let us know if you, uh, if you served in Iraq as well. Uh, we want to hear that uh, and your thoughts on what's happening now. Uh, phone lines are open. We want to go back to the political situation in Iraq. Talk about Prime Minister Nouri. Nouri al-Maliki and uh, what his role is uh, today in, in Iraq. Before uh, the segment started, you said he's not Saddam Hussein. Right. He's not Saddam Hussein uh, in the sense that, I mean, Saddam was an extremely brutal dictator who killed tens of thousands, used chemical weapons against his own population to maintain his hold on power. Maliki's nothing like that. However, he does appear to be uh, an autocrat in the making. And what's happening in Iraq right now is a political crisis. You wouldn't actually know it from a lot of the news coverage because there isn't much news coverage coming out of Iraq. A lot of the news media has basically abandoned Iraq. New York Times still has a bureau there, but it's one of the few. Uh, but um, he's been cracking down on a lot of his political opponents. And just uh, a week or so ago, he did something that in our system would be extraordinary. Uh, security officials from the Ministry of Interior detained the security detail of, of the finance minister of the, Ma of the Maliki government, Rafi al-Sawi, because he's a Sunni, Maliki's a Shiite, and he's a member of an opposition political party. And, and just to even now... And we're showing our viewers your right. story on this issue. Tensions right. rise in Baghdad with, raise on, with raid on official. And it's gotten worse since then, because I'm in touch with Iraqis. And what you have now is demonstrations in Alambar province in uh, Fallujah and Ramadi, I think the estimates are 50 to 100,000 people demonstrating all through the weekend, and, and they also cut the highway from uh, Iraq to Jordan. So you have a, a very polarized and fraught uh, political situation, and unfortunately the American influence in Iraq is, is somewhat attenuated at this point. Is this a country drifting back towards dictatorship? It's a, it's a country whose future is uncertain, and uh, certainly it could become, uh, it, it already is veered a bit off the path of democracy in my assessment, and, and, uh, but the battle really isn't lost. The, the American government, the Obama administration, is trying to do what it can to stabilize things, but it's lost a lot of influence in Iraq with the departure of American forces. 
One thing that the American forces uh, did give the United States was more clout inside Iraq. Uh, talk about the release of uh, a man accused of killing American soldiers, uh, this issue that you write about in your book, uh, mm -hmm. The Endgame, uh, but also some news that came out in November about the release of Ali Musa Dakduk. Is, am I saying that correct? Yeah. Um, well, there have been a number of events that I think have worked against American interests in Iraq. Um, and the, the case you signed of Dakduk uh, is one of them. He is not an Iraqi. He's a Lebanese Hezbollah operative uh, who was uh, sent into Iraq at the behest of the Iranian Quds Force because Hezbollah is uh, uh, supported by Iran for the purposes of training Shiite militias who are fighting American troops. And he was captured along with a number of uh, Shia militia leaders in a raid conducted in Basra by the Brits in which there was an American presence held in detention by the United States. But then under the Status of Forces Agreement, he was handed over to the Iraqis. This and agreement that we weren't able to extend. Right. Okay. And really what the Obama administration hoped was that he would either be extradited to the United States for some form of trial, but probably by military tribunal. They requested extradition. That was denied. Then they hoped he would at least be detained further in Iraq. But um, uh, Maliki was under pressure from the United States to keep Daduk and under, by the Iranians to release them. So what he did is he held them through the American election, uh, which he thought was a favor to the Obama administration, even though they didn't ask for that, uh, and then he released him. So it's one of a number of steps that has been taken which uh, cuts against uh, American interests there. Here's some stats on the Iraq war by the numbers. U.S. troops killed 4,482. U.S. troops wounded 32,213. Estimated cost, uh, this from ABC News, $704.6 billion. Uh, after all that, with, with those numbers, people will ask, why wasn't the U.S. able to influence Iraq enough to extradite Dak Duke uh, back to the, the U.S.? Do, even after all we've spent, we can't get Dak Duke back? That's not the only problem. Um, Iran has been flying arms to the Assad regime in Syria through Iraqi airspace. We've been trying to get the Iraqis to insist the Iranian planes land for inspection. They've only done two inspections, and one was of a plane returning empty from Damascus. So uh, it's a good question, and I think the answer is a complicated one, but I would say two things. One, in any country that's um, a newly emerging country, newly emerging you know, government, there is a sense of nationalism that you have to contend with, which is legitimate. The United States doesn't own Iraq. They have their own government, their own leaders. We can't dictate to them what to do. And there are a lot of states in the region that have their trying to meddle in Iraq. The Iranians, big time, Turkey, the Gulf states, they're all trying to exert influence inside Iraq. But also, I think a big part of the answer is really it's what's happened in the United States. The, the American government is conflicted on Iraq. Um, the Obama administration itself was, was ambivalent about whether we should keep forces in Iraq uh, beyond 2011 or not. In fact, that President Obama campaigned on the, um, uh, the tenet that he had extricated forces from Iraq completely. They had planned to, uh, the military had hoped to keep maybe five to 10 to 15,000 there, including to fight Al Qaeda. But um, so, you know, when the American government itself doesn't see Iraq as a priority, and, and it doesn't at this point in time, then I think that also limits the amount of influence you can have inside that country. Again, we're taking your calls on this subject, uh, the war in Iraq, and what's happening in Iraq now. We're with Michael Gordon of the New York Times. The phone lines are open. We'll go to Mohammed from New York, New York on the Democratic line. Good morning, Mohammed. Good morning. Uh, my question is, uh, looking back 10 years later, does uh, Michael feel any sense of responsibility, at least not to say shame, for the lead up to the Iraq war, her articles in the Times with Judith Miller? Does he at least now owe an apology to the families of those who got killed in Iraq? Thank you. Well, um, you're referring to the WMD coverage, uh, the coverage of the issue of weapons of mass destruction in the New York Times prior to the war. And since you're familiar with it, you're aware that um, I reported the CIA assessment that Iraq was um, uh, 
trying to acquire materials to make nuclear weapons, but you should also be aware that I also reported the IAEA assessment that this was not the case.